Exodus chapter 12, beginning with verse 21. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. You shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that's in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that's in the basin. None of you shall go out of thy door of the house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through and smite the Egyptians. When he seeth the blood on the lintel, upon the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come into the, unto your house and to smite you. You shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. Today we observe the Lord's Supper. I'd like to take us back to the original Lord's Supper. When we talk about the supper that Jesus had with the disciples in the upper room, we call it the Lord's Supper or the Last Supper. But many folks don't realize they were observing the Passover. That Last Supper was the Passover that Jesus celebrated with his disciples. And so I read you the scripture about the original Passover. And let's get a little bit of historical background today. When we look at that original Passover, you know the story of the Israelites who were enslaved in Egypt. Many plagues had been offered to Pharaoh to say, release my people. And Pharaoh refused until finally that last plague where God said, I will pass throughout all the land of Egypt. The firstborn will die. But you know, when there's death and destruction, God always makes a way. God always makes a way of escape from the penalty of sin. God always makes a way of escape when there's tragedy and difficulty on the horizon. And so he said to Moses, go tell all the people there's going to be a death coming, but there's a way of escape. And that way of escape is to pick out a lamb. And the lamb that you're to pick out is not the worst, one that's sick, one that's broken, one that's about to die, but pick out the very best lamb of the flock. Look at your flock and get the very best that you have. And you bring that lamb and you offer that lamb in a sacrifice. You collect the blood of that lamb as it's killed in sacrifice. And then you take some hyssop and you dip into that blood and you put it on the doorpost of your house and on the lintel of the house. And you make sure that you apply that blood. It's not enough just to sacrifice a lamb. It's not enough just to collect the blood. Make sure that blood is applied to the doorpost of your house to the going in and the coming out, to both side posts, and to the little over the top, make sure your house is covered by the blood. And when that death angel comes through, when he sees the blood, that death that will affect everyone who's not to have the blood applied will not affect you. I'm making a way to escape the penalty of sin. I'm making a way for you to escape the penalty of slavery. I'm making a way for you to escape all the consequences that rebellion against God has brought. You see, when you apply that blood, when that death angel sees the blood, then you will be spared. I remember that old song. I haven't heard it in years and years. I want to find out how many old folks like me grew up in little country churches where they used to sing a song, When I see the blood, I will pass. I will pass over you. Any of you remember that old song? I haven't heard that, I haven't heard that song in years. It's time I heard it again, Chris. Don't know if that will do any good or not. But I remember that old song. And that's what he was all about. When that death angel saw the blood that had been shed and that had been applied, then no one who was in that house would suffer the consequences that they would be spared. Because you see, our God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to salvation. And he always makes a way of escape. And he always says that when there is a destruction ahead, but I've got a provision for escape. So that was the background. And he said to those um, to Moses, for generations and generations, you tell the story. You observe that Passover. That happened well over 3,000 years ago, folks. And the Jewish people still today observe that Passover. And that Passover was the forerunner to what we know as the Lord's Supper that we observe today. Well, Jesus and the disciples observed that Passover that we refer to as the Last Supper or the Lord's Supper. It was their observance of the Passover that took place that night. And in the middle of the eating of that Passover, Jesus said something that shook his disciples to the core. Jesus made a dramatic statement when he said, I am the Passover lamb. 
All that's been looking forward for a generation as that Passover lamb was offered, it was looking forward to the time when the lamb of God would come, when no longer would they have to sacrifice a lamb every year, but God would provide the lamb, and that lamb would pay the price of sin. That lamb would shed his blood. And in the middle of the meal, Jesus said, I am the Passover. And he passed that cup. And he said, you drink this cup and it's a symbol of my blood. And you drink that bread and it's a symbol of my body that's broken for you. And he said, from now on, when you protect the Passover, you don't eat a lamb. And you don't drink the orange juice there or the grape juice or whatever juice you have there. But when you partake of the Passover, you remember it and you take a symbol of bread and that's my body. That's my Passover that's shed for you. And you drink that grape juice and that's my blood that's shed for you. That is the Lord's Supper where Jesus became our Passover. And today we don't offer a lamb. We don't offer a goat. We don't offer a calf because the sacrifice has been made. He's paid it in full. The debt's been paid. Jesus on Calvary's cross paid the price that I deserve to pay and the price that you deserve to pay to give us something we can never deserve, we can never earn, we can never buy, but we can have when that blood is applied to our life. Jesus said, I have become that lamb. And every time you partake of that Lord's Supper, He didn't tell us how often we had to do it. They did the Passover once a year. Some churches partake of the Lord's Supper once a year. Most churches do it about once a quarter, and I think that's what we try to do. He didn't say how often you partake, but He said every time you partake of the Lord's Supper, you remember, I am the Passover lamb. I took the place of that lamb up until the time of Jesus. They offered that sacrifice of that lamb and they looked forward to the time when God would send His lamb. Now we look back and say, on Calvary's cross, God sent His lamb. And the lamb paid the price for you and for me. The lamb paid the price of our redemption. We can stand today saying that redemption has been paid. The price has been paid, but you know there's one thing. Moses had the word from God. Yes, you've got to take a lamb. You've got to sacrifice it, and you've got to spread that blood on the doorpost. That blood has to be applied. You know what, folks? It's not enough that Jesus died on the cross. It's not enough that he shed his blood. It's got to be applied to our life. Until that blood has been applied, it has no effect. Until that blood has been applied, we're still under the curse of death. Until that blood has been applied, that death angel will not see us and pass by and say, that's one of my children. You see... So many times we say, oh, I know Jesus shed his blood. So many people will say, oh, I believe Jesus was the Son of God. But the question is, has his blood been applied to your life? Has there been a time in your life when you come to Jesus saying, I know I'm a sinner and we all are. I know I've sinned, but Lord, I know that you shed your blood to pay for my sin. And I accept the payments that you made. I accept that the blood you shed applied to my life. The question today is, has the blood been applied? What a waste if the very Son of God gave His life on the cross so that you could be one of His and live with Him and you refuse to have that blood applied to your life. You see, the blood has to be applied. Now, Moses told the Israelites, you pick out the very best lamb you've got. The very best of your flock. You give the best that you have as a sacrifice to God. God looked down and he said, I'm going to give the best I have as a sacrifice for mankind. Amen. And God chose not an angel, not Gabriel, the archangel, but he chose his only begotten son, his only unique son, the only one of his kind. And he said, I give my son to be the sacrificial lamb. I give my son to pay the price of sin. Why did he give his son? Because he's the only one who qualified. It had to be a perfect life. It had to be a sinless life. It had to be the best that he had. God gave the very best that he had for you and me. And that very best was his son. And that son who never committed a sin in his life paid for your sin and mine. You see, a sinner can only pay for his own sin. A sinner deserves to die because of what he's done. But the spotless son of God who never committed a sin died to pay for our sins. He was qualified, folks, because he had no sin for which he had to pay. And so he died to pay for your sin and for my sin. That lamb was killed as humanely as possible, but Jesus was killed as inhumanely as possible. They drug him out and put him through a kangaroo court. 
Even during the trial, they would slap him and say, testify, who was it that hit you? They grabbed his beard by the hands full and plucked out that beard. They put a crown of thorns on his head and pressed it down into his brow. And then they beat him mercilessly to the very point of killing him by that wheel until his back was cut and bruised and bloody. And then they put a big heavy cross and told him to carry his cross. And then, on Golgotha's hill, they stretched out his arms and they drove something like railroad spikes into his hands and into his feet. As inhumanely as possible, this world took the Son of God and said, I'll put you to death. How the devil danced with glee when he said, we've killed the Son of God. Oh, it was a very sad Friday, but I tell you, Sunday morning came and he arose. And he arose to show that because he lives, we can live. Amen. Because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Yeah. Because he lives, it doesn't matter what the devil will throw at us. We can face the difficulties because we don't have to face them alone. Amen. Jesus suffered the most inhumane death a person could ever experience and know. You know, while he hung there, all those scribes and Pharisees and even the thieves on the side began to mock and say, you saved others yourself, you cannot save. If you're the Son of God, come down now from the cross. Let me tell you, it wasn't those nails that kept Jesus on the cross. It was his love for you and me. Yes. Have you ever read where the Bible says, God had more than ten legions of angels standing by. Jesus just had to speak the word and he could have come down off that cross. But he chose to stay there because the only way he could pay for you and me was for him to choose not to save himself. And so there's a strange irony in those words. He saved others himself he cannot save. Because you see, the only way to save us was not to save himself. And had he chosen to save himself, there would have been no payment for your sin and my sin. Jesus became the Lamb of God. And all of those hundreds of years when they sacrificed that lamb at the Passover looked forward to the time the lamb of God would come. And today as we observe the Lord's Supper we look back on the fact the lamb of God did come. The lamb of God shed his blood. The lamb of God gave his life for you and me. And as we partake of the Lord's Supper we're called to remember. We're called as I always like to say to look back to look back at the price that was paid for our salvation. Our salvation is free, but folks, it is not cheap. It demanded the greatest payment that's ever been made. The very blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Your salvation is free, but it is not cheap. It is the most expensive price ever paid. Amen. We're called to look back. And we're called to look in. Every time we partake of the Lord's Supper, it ought to be a revival, folks. We ought to look in and examine ourselves. We ought to look in and say, Lord, I commit myself to you again. Lord, I accept you as my Lord and Savior without any reservation, without any holding back. Lord, everything I am and everything I have, I give to you. It's a time of looking in. It's a kind of dedication. The Lord's Supper is a time of revival, folks. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, it ought to be a time when we revive. We say, oh, Lord, revive my soul again that I may rejoice in thee. You know, the Lord's Supper is also a time of looking ahead because Jesus said, you do this until I come. And he reminded us as he came once, he's coming again. Praise God, he's coming again. And when we partake of the Lord's Supper, yes, we look back and yes, we look in, but we look ahead with confidence that Jesus is coming again. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Amen.